All right, what's up, everybody? It's BQ here with Adam and Ro the Great, a.k.a. Ro the Grizzly. Not really, I just decided to say that. We're going to talk about Impact Wrestling, the 2017 year in review. Talk about each of the divisions, X Division, Knockouts, Tag Team Division, Global Championship. A little bit about the pay-per-views, the whole GFW thing and all that. So we're just going to talk Impact for the year and... Um, We'll be reviewing the show again come January of 2018. So, got Adam and Rowan the place to be. I want to kick this off with, um, this was a very confusing year. There was, uh, we've said this many times on the podcast, that every single set of tapings was a reboot of, of some, in some way, shape, or form. Different direction, different creative, every single set. Not one felt the same. We started off the year as TNA. Still, we were still TNA. Uh, became Impact Wrestling in March, and then became Global Force Wrestling soon after that. And then we are back to Impact Wrestling. So, um, <laughs> some confusing stuff. Many regime changes. Many many uh, creative changes, and just confusing. Just a complete cluster. Adam, would you agree? Com just complete cluster. Complete mess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're quite right. When I just think over the last year, every show looked different. Every set of tapings felt different. And now, it, one thing that they have done is they've got, for want of a better phrase, the TNA stink, I think, off the product because it doesn't feel like TNA in the slightest anymore. It just feels like a televised wrestling show, which has some of the characters that are in TNA. It feels a completely different program now from when it was at the beginning of the year now whether you think that's a good thing or not is is, is up to the listeners but uh it, it it does feel like they've moved away from it although internet fans will still refer to it as tna and dixie's company and all these kind of things to me they feel like two polar opposites of what they what it used to be i just thought you know a lot of with a lot of the changes where you know as a fan it became hard to follow because, you know, we've seen with a certain regime, certain people being utilized and then another regime comes in, these people being utilized and the former people not being utilized. So it just became hard to really kind of get behind somebody because we'd see somebody like, um, I'll use EC3, for example, you know, he, he was the top guy. And then with all the changes, we just started gradually seeing him used to this capacity, then used in the, um, you know, the AAA triple a feud and it was just you know so so much inconsistencies and i felt like that hurt the product it did it was and i think they lost a lot of people along the way this year and i think for everything we want to say about the hardys i think they did bring some extra eyes on the product last year and then it changed so much this year that i think i think they lost a lot of people they really over the course of the year only had maybe four or five good um and for by their standards, good good uh, episodes of viewership, and this past episode that we just watched, last one of the year, probably the best one of the year in my opinion. I know Ro keeps talking, you know, kept talking about. I think they're going to put together a really good show to end the year, and I, I thought they really did. But worst worst numbers in Impact Television history. And something I think people need to remember is that first run television is not the end all be all, especially not in this age. They probably make more money off the digital streams than they do off Pop TV, so I know, I know we, we like we want to see those numbers up and that's great and everything, but it doesn't affect the money coming in from Pop TV. Um, if one person watches it or a million people watch it, I, I think I think you're, you're absolutely right on that point, and you know they truly are an international company at this point, being number two or three or four in, in the US doesn't make a blind bit of difference to, to impact anymore because they've got deals in the UK and they've got them all over the world. I was going to list off some of them, but you know, they'll be getting bits of money from each of these territories and they are now building a brand and with the, the, the network as well, where they're going to be bringing in other promotions and those kind of things. I think they've got a sound base to work off now as a opposed to just trying to be the number two company in America. I think it's a much better business model saying we're international and we're going to have partnerships with, they're almost going to be run like the NWA, which is ironic that Billy, who was with them at the beginning of the year, I think uh, is no longer there. He's running the NWA. <laughs> yeah. I think um, 
Well, here in the United States, someone had just told me the other day, I didn't know because I, I never watched it on the app and didn't realize I could, but, or at least not this quickly, I guess Impact is on the Global Wrestling Network only two days after it airs on TV. I believe it's different. I believe it's different in different countries. And yeah. I think if there's a, a TV deal like in the UK, then you can't get it within 24 hours or something like that as, as part of their contract deals. But if you're in a country, I don't know, like Zimbabwe, I don't know why that, that one. Uh, then and you've got the global network wrestling up there. I think you can watch it pretty much live. Is, is my understanding. It depends where you're based and you know what the TV deals are. So as far as uh, the global wrestling network, row, what what do you think needs to happen for this to take off? Because right now it's kind of a basic service. What do you think in 2018 needs to happen with the global wrestling network to see these numbers really start you know pouring in? Um, I think the obvious is probably adding, <clears throat> excuse me, pay-per-views. So whether it's, you know, I, I think coming in 2018, I think they're, we're saying we're going to get three pay-per-views as opposed to just slam adversity and bound for glory, but also the, uh, one night onlys, you know, I think putting their pay-per-views on the global wrestling network for a discounted rate, I think that'll help the numbers tremendously. I think you're kind of right with that one, although the one night only is I wish I would get away from this, their pay-per-views. I'd rather they do what the WWE does and say that they're specials, the special events, you know, so that it's not a pay-per-view that you can go by on another thing, but it's part of a network subscription. Uh, because it, a, a pay-per-view seems to me that it's a storyline building towards something, whereas at the moment, the one night only is it's just a random collection of matches thrown together usually. So I'd rather see them, you know, as specials as opposed to pay-per-views i know it's maybe just the terminology thing but uh, i agree with you in principle though i think it would be good if they get those on the app ed norholm had said in the top of the year that uh i don't know if it was the top of the year about the middle of the year that in 2018 the two thousand the um one night onlys were going to be i don't know take more important i don't think it's going to be storyline driven at all but in 2017 we didn't really get any good one night only shows that i can think of and in 2016, they were pretty bad to start the year, but then we ended up getting, you know, about three good ones. I thought the knockouts one this year was really good. They didn't do the X Division one, I don't believe, which is fine because I thought the, the last one absolutely put me to sleep. But, you know, they, they keep saying Impact cameras are following WrestlePro and all these companies. So I'm really excited to see come January what One Night Only is going to be. It's it's good. I'm really glad they're not doing the matinee tapings and all that crap because when they do the matinee tapings in the Impact Zone for one night only, those are the crowds that are like no joke tourists. And I've said it a hundred times, maybe even more. There's not as many tourists as people think in the Impact Zone, but for those one night onlys, that is like straight touristy. So I think that's been hurting them a lot. So excited to see what one night only brings. We already know we're going to, I think they're going to put Jack, you know, Jack Swagger had a couple matches with Impact guys and it's going to be interesting and uh, hopefully it's better. It's something that I think does need to be on the app. Hopefully we get three pay-per-views and we really need to get AAA and Noah on there. From what, I don't know if you guys caught this, someone brought this to my attention. You know, the uh, start to the show, how they show all the different companies and everything. They no longer have the Crash logo pop up. Oh, wow. I didn't even notice that. <laughs> well, I didn't notice either, but that, that's, uh, that would be a loss. But it, it's strange, isn't it? Because uh, Conan was with them, wasn't he? But he got fired. Is that right? Or yeah, I thought, he, I thought he ran the crash. I, I'm so confused. I haven't looked into it really, but I, th I thought he ran it. For, for some reason, I, I thought, so did I, but I thought he got fired from it or, or oh, something like that. Uh, but uh, so, yeah, I, I don't really know. Uh, so maybe it's something to do with the fact that He's obviously prominently featured uh, as part of LAX. So maybe that there's, there's some, something to do with that. Uh, and also, isn't um, Garza Jr., wasn't he, is he Crash as well? Yeah, he was the only Crash guy that appeared on Impact. And we haven't and seen him in weeks, have we? No, we haven't. Uh, now, regarding this partnership with the Crash, they're smaller than AAA, obviously. And Crash was not very much featured on Impact television. But Impact wrestlers were going to crash all the time. And it's it's a much bigger payday uh, for them to wrestle in the crash than to do an indie, indie show. So that's kind of another 
payday that some of the impact wrestlers are losing because they don't they don't get that booking anymore. Um, maybe they do. I don't know. But as far as a partnership in the public eye, looks like that one's done. Unfortunately, but uh, Noah and uh, AAA, they need to get on the app. I want to see them bring more wrestlers to Noah because it's always Eddie Edwards and Moose. You mm. know, and at the same token, though, we only get Ishimori. I would like to see a few more international and certainly European uh you know uh promotions on there as well you know there's some great ones in the uk but i mean one that jumps out in my mind where it would fit in and would would look awesome would be uh icw up here in glasgow uh insane championship wrestling which is where grado and drew mcintyre was champion for a long time and people like that uh and they've they've got quite a big fan base in the uk they they tour all over the uk even though they're scottish based so I, i'd like to see a partnership somewhere along them and I, I'm amazed that they haven't got anyone in the UK yet as part of this. Amazing. I think uh, Roe might have been the one that pointed that out to me, that there's no UK wrestlers on the roster. I mean, I guess Grado. Yeah, Grado, talking of which, uh, many condolences if if he does hear this, but his mother passed away the other day. He was posting on Facebook, and that might have had, I think she was will for quite some time, so that may be why he hasn't featured in these Ottawa tapings very much. Yeah, that's, that's really unfortunate. Um so yeah, definitely condolences out out uh, to Grado. But uh, moving right along, so let's talk the X division. Uh, the X division started off with Trevor Lee as the champion, and then at Destination X, I guess he was a champion for a while, and then uh, Destination X came around, and there was the multi man match that featured Sanjay and the returning Loki. Loki wins a championship. Eventually drops it to Sanjay in India. And now we are back at Trevor Lee again at the end of the year. And he's going into 2018 as the champion. So, Ro, what do you think the overall on the X division? You know, um, obviously this was a division that got the biggest shot of adrenaline in the arm. When the new regime came, they really said, okay, we got to make the X division the X division again. And for the most part, they've really done that. Starting to get some storylines. Not just multi-man matches, getting one-on-one matches, getting tag team matches. So what do you got on the uh, X Division in 2017? I thought there was a great emphasis on fixing the X Division this year because that was one thing that really got lost, previously got lost. And, you know, we, we see now where there's more of a focus where it's not just throw X Division guys in multi-man matches. I mean, we get them here and there, but not as frequently. My only um, grips were, I think there was a couple points in time this year where they missed some opportunities, like the the feud with um, Andrew Everett and Trevor Lee. I thought that's what we were kind of leading to, where maybe we see Andrew Everett ultimately capture the X Division Championship. And then also not following up with Desmond Xavier winning the Super X Cup. You know, one would assume him winning that would have put him in line for uh, number one contendership for the X Division Championship. But once again, you know, with so many changes, like I have to believe, you know, one regime was probably behind certain individuals versus the other. But I think moving forward, just keep doing what they're doing. Give us a mixture of one-on-one matches you can give us some tags multi-mans and you know give us some storylines not everything has to be circled around the title you can give us just some basic one-on-one feuds i'd like to add about trevor lee oh, sorry I'll, I'll change that january 2017 trevor lee sucked december 2017 trevor lee is awesome and i think that to me sums up the journey of this x division over the year uh, I, I just think that at the beginning of the year, as Rose said, Cry Valley said there, it looked like it was leading to Mandra Everett stuff, uh, who looked like the star of the, the Helms dynasty. But uh, just by the fact that I think he got injured, didn't he, from memory? Uh, he had quite a bad injury. And that's just let Trevor Lee move into his own character, which, quite frankly, as we've said on the podcast many a times, um, Shane was holding him back. And none of us knew that, that Trevor Lee had this in him. And... I actually really like the position they're in now. You know, I, I think overall the year has been pretty flat for the for the, the X division. I, I like Loki, but Sanjay Dutt, I think he only got it because they were going to India, to be honest. I think that, that's pretty obvious why he got it. And he's, he's the booker. 
and maybe it's a thank you for his years of service, but it was pretty flat during his reign. It was pretty flat at the beginning of the year, but at the moment, I'm loving the X Division. You know, the cult of Lee's awesome. Um, Desmond Xavier looks like, you know, he's going to go on to massive things. Ishimori looks great every time he's in the ring. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really pleased with how they've set it up for next year. There's some interesting stuff going on there. In 2018, we should be getting Hakeem Zayn entering the mix there as a much-needed heel in the X Division. And um, I think we're going to have a big year for Desmond Xavier. And we'll see if Idris Abraham gets uh, thrown into the mix again. So... Row out of uh, the whole roster, kind of putting you on the spot here. Who do you think is going to have the biggest 2018 for the X Division? Desmond Xavier. And I think with him, too, I think he's going to be one of these guys where he's probably going to dominate the X Division for some time. And then probably at the end of the year, he might be mixing it up. If not the mid card, then maybe even the main event. But I'm going with Desmond Xavier. Um, yes. Either him or possibly Hakeem Zayn. And the only reason I go for Hakeem Zayn, I don't think he'll hold the title as long as possibly Desmond will. But he just seems to have uh, an edgier character, a more interesting character. And because he's one of the few heels, I think he'll have an amazing year next year. I think they will put the belt on him at some point and he'll have a food, feud with, with, with Desmond. I would have gone for Trevor Lee, but I honestly think the cult of Lee's was probably going to be something else going forward. Uh, and I, we talked about it on, on the, the podcast, the review of the last show there, that I think the cult of Lee will move into maybe a tag team stable of some sort, you know, in the same kind of bad influence type of type of mold. I, I think that they can they are that good and they can they can move away from the X division. Totally agreed with that. I think they are going to there's only so much Trevor Lee can do in the X division moving forward. So I can see them as a, a tag team going forward. Absolutely. And I think that is what will happen. But I guess we'll we will wait and see. I'm going with Desmond Xavier. Also, I think Hakeem Zayn, to your point, is going to have a tremendous year. Um, I could see him actually being that top heel in the X division sooner than later. So, but I'm going to go with uh, Desmond Xavier. So let's talk knockouts here. The knockouts had an interesting year. Uh, Rosemary started off the year as the champion, came very short of having the longest knockouts title reign. I think she should have got it. She was a heel at the time, very dominant heel, was doing really good things with the title. And she ends up losing the title at Slammiversary to Sienna. So Sienna is 2-0 at Slammiversary, winning the Knockouts Championship. Sienna held it for quite some time, drops it to Gail Kim at Bound for Glory. Gail Kim makes the title vacant when she retires, and Laurel Van Ness is the champion. She's not going to be the champion for very long, obviously. And we'll see what happens at the January tapings. Allie's the number one contender. I'm sure Rosemary is still going to be in the mix there. So that's going to be interesting with 2018. 2018 needs to be a huge year for the knockouts. The uh, Women of Honor just introduced a uh, women's championship. I think the belt is ugly. It's got too much pink on it. But with that being said... Now that they're establishing more of a women's division every over there, the knockouts have more competition when it comes to being the number one women's division. So needs to be a huge year. If they bring girls aboard, they have to contribute. And we're going to see Hanaya here pretty soon on television. And hopefully Kira Hogan will make her debut sooner than later. Are we going to see Tessa Blanchard? I don't know, but I think it's going to be a fun year for the knockouts. And I think... I think that's as much as we saw the resurgence of the X Division in 2017, I think 2018 is going to be the year of the knockouts. So, Ro, what do you got on the year uh, 2017 when it came to the knockouts division? Um, it, You know, for as far as for the knockouts division, I thought it was solid up until we got into uh, when it seemed like the whole Gail Kim retirement tour. I felt like then it kind of got hijacked a little bit, but uh, I, I didn't really have too many problems with it. But I think moving forward, what they're going to have to do, one thing is when you have a champion like with Sienna and then even with Rosemary, and th I guess this was the one problem. It seems like once, you know, a knockout loses a championship, they have no idea how to 
you know, book them moving forward. So that's one thing moving forward. What they need to do is, you know, figure out, you know, someone who's not in currently in the title picture, how to best utilize them. But as far as 2018, I think the first part of the year is going to be the, the, the knockout t- uh, championship picture is going to be dominated between uh, Rosemary, Taya, um, Sienna and Ali, and then I think towards the end we're gonna see, you know, maybe Kara Hogan, Hanaya, and then even Ava Story probably in the mix of things. I am going to go controversial on this one and say that. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that I think that the year was fantastic. Uh, you know, there was, as, you, as Ro quite rightly said, the bit with Gail Kim coming back did kind of derail things a little bit, uh, but it still was quite interesting. And what it did do was took the the, I suppose the eyes off Sienna, which she didn't deserve to have happened to her. Uh, a bit like Eli Drake at the moment, Sienna became uh, a bit of a sideshow to the main storyline going on. But I think overall, the, the knockout has always been strong. It, it was another strong year for them. And I think that unfortunately, if, if Laurel Van Ness had stayed around, I think she would have been the biggest star of next year. Uh, as it turns out, I think that next year is going to be the Alley show. I really do. And I think it's also going to be a year of two halves that she will start. And she's basically going to have a Taryn Terrell moment where she's the baby face all the way through. And eventually she'll form some heel stable around her and just turn like that into a dollhouse mark two of some sort. I think that's going to happen at some point. Um, but, yeah, really exciting times. And I, I don't think there's anyone needs to worry about the, the knockouts division because it's always been strong. It's been really well booked this year, and I think I'll continue. Roe makes a really good point that it seems like when someone drops the, the belt, they don't really know what to do with them. And uh, I, I want to say they started the year with uh, Jade was still in the division, wasn't she? Yeah, she was still kind of feuding with Rosemary. I think they were trying to make that the big rivalry. I was never a, a major Jade fan just because I, I I can't get behind people who can't talk on the mic. That's That's always something that just... I can't seem to work around. And I thought Jade was really poor on the mic. If she decided to come back, I'd be happy to see it because I think she's a talented competitor. But I think we've moved on past that. I I don't see how she could factor in. I think they're going to be trying to decide in 2018 who's the the face of this division. And I think you're right. I think it'll be the Ali show. We can go back and forth on Ali all day. I know Adam is one that wants to see her get a little more serious. I have no problem with her character because I, to me, that's kind of what brought her to the dance. Does she have to tweak it a little bit? Obviously, you can't be the face of the division and, you know, be so silly. But I think she has to maintain elements of that. And I think ever since Slammiversary, she's wrestled in the ring just fine. I still see people on Twitter to this day. They need to stop acting like she can't wrestle. They haven't been acting like that since since Slammiversary. That, you know, that's my opinion. Uh, what do you think about Allie, Rowe? You know, because Adam and I had this conversation on the podcast yesterday when we were, when we were reviewing Impact, so we both look at Allie a little bit different. Um, this previous uh, Impact where they had the number one contenders match for the Knockouts Championship, um, I see I see a change with her. I, and I've seen it, you know, the past few times we've seen her wrestle. I think what happened with her, and once again, you know, I hate to beat a dead horse, but with a lot of the regime changes, you know, we never really got that big payoff when, you know, her you know, her angle with Maria. So then, you know, her, she kind of stayed resorted back into, you know, the whole not knowing how to wrestle and whatnot. But I think she's going to be, you know, the top uh, baby face for the knockout division. So, I mean, you can keep some elements of it, but from what I see, as far as how she is in the ring, I'm, I'm fine with that. I think, I think she's progressing fine. And I think once you know, or if she were to win the championship again, I think we'll we'll really see kind of an edge with her. It seems like the knockouts division is going to be very heel heavy, and it and it's funny because months ago I had said, "Hey, Sienna is the only heel in this division," because there was Laurel, but she wasn't taken being you know being taken seriously at the time. Now the Laurel character is finally coming around after the the second slowest build in the company outside of Ali, and we're not really going to get the payoff with that either. But I think you're right. I think when we didn't get the payoff with Allie and Maria, I think it threw a curveball on how to book Allie going forward. And they ended up blowing that feud off in the, in the uh, not even with Allie, but they kind of uh, supplemented her with Laurel and KM and everything. And they, 
they kind of blew that off in the pre-show at Slammiversary. That kind of sucked too because we didn't really get the payoff that we really wanted. But now it seems like they're very heel heavy. And there's a, you know, if you looked at the uh, guy the match with Ali on Impact, number one contenders, you know, all against all heels. I believe Hanaya is going to be hooked, uh, booked as a heel next year. Kira Hogan, I, I would imagine, will be a baby face. And there's Taya in the heel division. Uh, not the heel division, but on the, on the heel side. I was telling Adam yesterday, I heard a rumor she's pregnant. And we may not see her next year at all, almost. I know why you chuckled then, by the way. Because you were thinking about my slam town joke. Yeah. That's why. It, it was so good, it deserved to repeat right. it. So right. He, <laughs> he took her to slam town. And uh, now we may not see Taya, period, next year. Because depending on... <laughs> Depending on when they do television, you know, like we might not get her at all. So I don't know if it's true or not. Yeah, you know what? I seen some photos of her, and I mean, you can only tell so much in a photo. I mean, you know, she's a very attractive woman, but it, you know, it kind of looked like, you know, when somebody, you know, we all know when you know a woman gets pregnant, you know, she puts on a little bit of size. But I mean, I don't know if it's just a picture or whatever. So, I mean, if she is, I mean, I mean, damn, you know. But congratulations to them. <laughs> I really want to see Tessa Blanchard in the company because I think they can really run with her um, as one of the top baby faces if they don't feel like Allie can fit to fill that role. But I think absolutely she should. And obviously, when January rolls around, we're going to get a brand new knockouts champion. Do you think it'll be, I'll ask you, Adam, first, do you think it's going to be Rosemary or Allie that takes the title off her? Well, obviously, Allie's in the number one contendership match. And so I, I would like to think that if they've got it for a set of tapings, that they're not just going to take it off in the first match and then, you know, shove her out the door. I'd like to at least make her look like a bit of a credible champion so that if Ali does win it, she's gone through, you know, a few barriers to get there, as opposed to first night squash match, she's the new champion. I'd like to have the Laura Van Ness title win mean something. So, um, I don't know. I, I think it will be Ali. I, I think they will put it on her. And um, just because they need, I think they just need someone to get behind that division. And everyone loves Ali. The audience love her. So I can't see why they wouldn't put it on her. I don't think it'll be Rosemary. It's too soon to put it back on her. Yeah, I'm in agreement with Adam. I think it's going to be Ali. And where I disagree with you at, Adam, is I think they'll just straight up hot shot it because one could you could argue that what might have hurt the ratings this past impact was the fact that you know not only people knew that lvm was winning but that she's leaving too so you couldn't really get excited for it because as a fan it's like on one end you're you're happy because we always wonder well when's lvm going to get in the mix of things once she gets the opportunity oh you know she's requested her release so i could see a scenario where they just take the belt off of her put it on alley and then, you know, just kind of write her off television that way. And I think the the money, one of the money feuds is to have Rosemary and Allie feud. So I think it'd make more sense to put it on Allie right now. And then you can kind of have Rosemary chasing it because I think they're going to have to tweak Rosemary's character just a tad bit. She's a, I mean, I know she's face, but I, it's something with her character. She doesn't look as strong as she used to. And I'm not saying turn her heel completely because the fact that, you know, you got her now interacting with the children in the crowd and whatnot, you know, you don't want to kill that. That's, you know, a good marketing uh, tool. But just tweak the character just a tad bit, you know, so then if they, you have them feuding, you know, it's, you know, be really, really, really good. Because I know a lot of times when you have face first face, sometimes it's, you know, it could be a hit and miss. I've got a question. Do you think that there's any chance that uh, Laurel Van Ness might stay I know she's asked for a release, but three months is a long time. And she's been obviously heavily promoting it and going a bit OGT on the social media about winning the title and how great impact is. But do you think there's any way that they could convince her to stay in it, or that she might? I think there's a possibility. Um, it might be a 10% chance, but I think there is a possibility. From what I understand, the plan is to have her drop the title at January and grant her release at that point. And that's what I'm sticking with. But I think there is a possibility that that she could decide, okay, I, I'm I'm gonna go forward with this uh, knockout division. You know, once the um, creative team comes together, and say, hey, this is well, this is what we could have planned for you if you decide to stay. It's a possibility. She she works a lot of indie dates. I mean, this girl works 
it, it seems like she works a good five days a week. Because don't forget, there's a new regime now from when she asked to be released because it's now Don Callis and, and Scott Damore who weren't there before. Oh, well, they were there, but they weren't the official team at that point. And she's asked for a release. And if they went to her and say, look, you know, you can go do your indie dates. We're not going to take 10% off you or whatever it is that the rumoured clause in the contract. Uh, and we've got this plan for you. You know, it could very well be that that she stays and for me that would be the win-win situation for everyone uh, i think she'll do better in, in in impact and i think that in lvn they've got a great character there who is a really good wrestler i think she's most probably the best wrestler on the roster for the, sorry the knockout roster um and i i think that it, you know she is worth you know getting the checkbook out i think so too i think she's one of the best in the world i, I honestly do yeah, I don't know though because where where I where I where I'm confused at is she asked for her release. Now, if you say she did this, you know, prior to the new regime, she you know she was booked to win the championship. You know, one would think like if there was a situation where they weren't going to utilize her, and she was asking that that was fine. She asked for a release, and you know. During that time when they, you know, decided, hey, we're going to put the knockouts championship on you. I mean, you could have said, okay, well, you know, never mind. I'll, I'll change, you know, I change my mind because I see that you guys are going to utilize me. So, I I mean, I, I do believe there is some, you know, there's a 10% chance she could stay. But, you know, she might have her foot out the door. And I, I just for me, it just left a bad taste in my mouth because, and, you know, BQ can allude to this. You know, we've seen this happen where, you know, they put belts on people who, you know, want to leave or asking to leave. So we got this champion on our TV where, you know, we know, you know, they've asked for their release. And, and, and it's hard to get behind, you know. And, I mean, if she decides to stay, that's wonderful, I think. You know, like we were talking about with the knockout division, you know, you put her up in the mix, you know, between her and the rest of them, you know, they could dominate the first part of the year. But, you know, knowing that she asked for her release when they already had made plans to book her as champion, I mean, I just say, you know, you take the belt off of her, you know, grant her her release and, you know, keep it moving. I've heard that Scott Namor is part of the problem with her. I don't know how true that is. Um, I think she was close to Dutch. And I don't think he's around anymore. So there might have been some backstage moves that, that did cause this. Let's move on, though. But who do you think? Oh, just to answer my own question, I actually think Rosemary wins the title. And I think Allie is going to chase it up until Slammiversary. I see Allie winning the title on a live show, um, not a taped one. So that's my thoughts on that. I'll ask you first, um, Adam, who do you think has the biggest year for the knockouts next year? I think it's going to be Ali, um, just because they haven't put the title on her and it's been such a slow build. I think she'll have a very quick turnaround in 2018 from being that baby face. I think the hill turn will happen uh, halfway through the year and she'll end up the year as champion, as a, as a heel. As I said, that Tyron Terrell kind of situation, I think that's going to happen to her next year. But all in all, it's all going to be about her all year, whether she's defending as a baby face or she's dominating as a part of a heel stable. I would say if the rumors aren't true as far as with uh, Taya, I'll, I'll go with Taya. But if not, yeah, I'll, I'll say Ali as well. All right, now I'm going to say Ali as well. So moving on into the tag team division, we started off the tag team division, uh, I mean the year, with the Broken Hardys as the champions. They end up vacating the titles because they had the titles at the time of their release. And LAX ends up winning the championship and had a very good title reign. The problem was they threw everybody at LAX too quickly. They could have had a long program with the Veterans of War. They could have had something with Reno Scum, but Reno Scum got hurt. Then they end up getting into a feud with OVE that nobody seemed to enjoy at first. They had the match of Bound for Glory, which was an excellent match, but it had a double turn at the end that wasn't well done. Then you add Sammy Callahan to the mix. All of a sudden, OVE is interesting again. LEX is interesting. So now we got an interesting tag team feud all of a sudden. We have no tag teams. It doesn't seem like Mario Boca was teaming with Falaba anymore. From what I understand, he's at the Canada taping, so I think he's still part of the company, but Falaba's obviously getting a singles run. And 
Veterans of War is not a, around anymore. Reno Scum's not around anymore. It's two teams. Maybe even three. Depends on if these other guys, these dudes that came out the other the, the other week and we haven't seen from them. Uh, the Canadian group, I already forgot their name. Dubois Brothers, I think. Dubois was one of their names, and the other was like Jock or, or something, something uh, real common. But uh, I know it's three initials. I don't remember exactly what it was. But So the tag team division is the one that's been kind of a mess all year. Uh, go to you first, Adam, with this one. Thoughts on the tag team division? Again, like I said, it started off with the Broken Hardys. And then it just seemed like a huge cluster. At one point, we had GFW tag team champions, and <laughs> yeah, um, interesting year. Let's put it that way. Uh, and, and, and I was a huge mark for the Hardys, uh, broken the broken Hardys. I, I thought they were great, and uh, I'll, I'll be honest, they kind of drew me back into wrestling when I felt fell out of love of it uh, last summer, or eighteen months ago. So. You know, although they're in the WWE and I don't like the way that things have played out with, with, with them, uh, I was huge fans of them. Um, obviously, Decay leaving was, was, was a shame as well. Um, you know, that didn't really help uh, when, after they took over the belts. But no, LAX are fantastic. They, every incarnation of LAX has been really, really good. And uh, the actual the two guys now who, who, are the, who are going after the tag belts, awesome. Um, I always get their names wrong, but it's uh, Santana and... Uh, Otis, I always want to say Tito. I don't know why Tito is always. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so um, I, I, they're they're brilliant. And Ovi, as you said, I, I can't really add anything else. It's it's been a strange year because they've had tag teams at different times and haven't used them, and it just seems like the feud has gone on forever. Even though Ovi have only been in it for six months, uh, but it does feel like this feud has just gone on for forever. I mean, I was at Slammiversary, and from memory, I don't think Ove win there at that time were they so was the tag team even defended at uh Sandberg? i don't think it was was it no it wasn't yeah you know it was it was the uh the match they threw together with the uh triple a noah and ah. uh crash correct it was illegal that, that pretty much sums up that, that it was a bit of a mess during the year but i think it's finished really strong and as we were saying on the uh the impact review of this week this last episode of the year um, it's said, you know, it's the best it's been in, in quite some time. I'd love them to bring in someone, some, some new faces in the new year and some recognized faces as well, a recognized team. Well, I, I don't know, a bad influence still wrestling in Ring of Honor? I don't know. Uh, I would love to see them back, even for just a nostalgia run. I, I think they could add a lot. Yeah, I, I thought the biggest problem, um, and this is a problem that, you know, happens a lot, but it seems like with the, with the, sorry. Um, with the tag team division, whoever's a champion, they've had a hard time kind of building strong contenders. We've seen with, you know, the Broken Hardys where a lot of tag teams were casualties at their expense, you know, Decay, DCC, and then with LAX where they had tag teams, you had an issue where they ran through so many people so quickly and they kind of fell into the feud with OVE. And, you know, they got something. But moving forward, they're going to have to find, you know, whether it's some makeshift tag teams or, you know, bring some tag teams in, keep the division strong. Well, we got a strong set of contenders. That way we're not seeing, you know, the same uh, tag team matches. The tag team I really want to see is actually the Ascension from WWE. Because when I was watching the product, it was kind of when they were hot in NXT. And then I remember they got called up and became a joke. Um... I, I read online that I think they're a comedy team now. So that's a team that I would actually love to see come over and uh, try to recapture some of that old magic. They used to have like a really cool entrance theme and entrance and then they just messed it all up. So that's who I would like to see. But this tag team division has been a mess. And, you know, Decay was kind of the team of 2016. The feud with the Hardys really hurt them. And then they kind of came into 2017 losing left and right. Crazy Steve leaves and decays no more. And it would have been really nice to still have them around. Uh, Rosemary got too big for decay. So I don't, I don't know if they would have worked without her, but just a really strange year. And I don't know what 2018 brings for that division. I've got no idea, but they, they have got to figure it out with this tag team division. There's not a lot of tag team divisions on the Indies that, that are hot enough to just kind of bring in. You're going to have to start 
putting together teams. And I mean, God, just to think a year, year and a half ago, two years ago, having teams like the Hardys and the Wolves and Beer Money and uh, Decay and, you know, even the Bromance to a point, I wasn't a big fan of them, but I thought, as I've said a few times, their match at Slammiversary last year was, was really good with Decay. And we, we, we just see these waves. It feels like one minute the tag team division is really strong, and then all of a sudden it's really, really weak. What I really hope doesn't happen is that Eli loses the belt and then they put uh, Adonis and uh, Drake down to the tag division. I really hope that doesn't happen, but it's something that I could see happening <laughs> just by the way that Eli Drake's eating pins every week and he's a sideline act at the moment. Yeah, I, I, I definitely could see that. Um, no, I, I don't think that's going to happen, but I, I could see a, a scenario where it does. But hopefully it doesn't. They really need Eli Drake in that main event scene right now. And um, that's really all I got for the tag team division. It wasn't, wasn't a very fun year, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, we got, I think that Global Force tag team tournament really, really hurt them because, again, it just... It threw too many feuds together too quickly. Not feuds, but too many possibilities together. LAX wrestled too many teams. And I think that really hurt the tag team division. There's one tag team out there who they could bring in. Uh, and that's the Young Bucks. <laughs> I know they're obviously on Ring of Honor. Uh, but, you know, if they wanted to get eyes on the product and have a super hot feud, that's the team that you want to get. Yeah, I don't see that happening. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, bring back the Rock and Roll Express as well, and uh, <laughs> the, the Blade Runners. This, this yeah, um, this, <laughs> yeah, this is the division where after they're going to have to build new stars next year. They they have no choice. They, they've got to figure it out. You know, they 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 uh, sorry, they they miss a lot of opportunities though. Where you know you have a lot of guys, <clears throat> excuse me, on the roster that they have nothing for. I mean, they could have done. KM and Congo Kong, you know, that would have been that would have been a nice tag team. I mean, what about Braxton Sutter? There, there's ways to kind of fill the void. I mean, you know, maybe in 2018 you establish your three tag teams, you know, where you got LAX, you got OVE, and then, you know, Code of Lee. But, you know, some of these other guys, that's how you you find some kind of magic. I think some well, some people might not remember, but with Beer Money, they essentially were just thrown together. Uh, Bobby Roode and uh, uh, James Storm. Then all of a sudden, building chemistry, they became you know, one of the big tag teams of the company. They might be able to find that, but sometimes you just kind of have to just give things, you know, give things a shot and see what you got. Yeah, throw it. I used to. Do, mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, I was going to say that uh, I used to do uh, some fantasy booking. Uh, some some weird crap um <laughs> so basically I, I ran a wrestling company an online wrestling company uh where i wrote all the storylines etc i was like the head of creative and, and ran it i know it sounds very weird don't judge me anyway uh i came up with a concept and i don't know if i've ever seen it on a wrestling show but i thought it worked really well in the context of building a, a tag team and that's almost like having um one of these uh you know tombolas or raffles where random people get tagged together for a tag team championship and just build a tag team from there. So effectively, you can carry on feuds and suddenly you've got a face and a heel tagging together to take on another made up team. And it could be one of these one night only's, but that, that's an easy way to build a, t a new tag team of two guys who are not doing anything. As you say, a Braxton Sutter or a, uh, a Gaza Jr. if he's still around, you know, all these guys, KM, you know, you could easily just hotshot them together with someone as part of a tournament and suddenly you know they're having a bit of fun they're picking up some fluky wins and uh there's some real chemistry going on it's a bit like cesaro and uh sheamus in, in wwe they were never meant to be a tag team but suddenly they are you know and the fans like them yeah um i think that's how they threw decay together as a matter of fact because you remember they do the joker's wild pay-per-view which 2016 was one of the worst wrestling pay-per-views i've ever seen in my life and then 2017, <laughs> I, th um, I don't remember much about it, but I thought it was pretty well done. But I always thought the Joker's Wild concept, like if they took it really serious, they could actually do a pretty badass um, uh, pay-per-view. You know, not just a one-night only, but, you know, they, they kind of make a joke. Oh, there's going to be a battle royal at the end and the person's going to win this money that they're really not going to win. I don't know. I, I, I like the concept of just putting people together. Braxton Sutter has a tag team partner on the indies. They're called the Well-Oiled Machines. 
Uh, I believe he wrestles in Border City. I could be way off base with that. But that would be really cool. I, I think he needs something to do. I mean, he was he kind of had that angle with Ali going, and all of a sudden we got nothing for him, and that drives me nuts because I'm, I'm a big fan of his. Would like to see something happen there. Um, but they, they got to fix this division. Absolutely. Uh, Grand Championship started the year off with Drew Galloway. Another guy left the company. I think Drew Galloway played the company. I think he came up with an excuse. That, oh, well, you know, they gave me a contract at the last minute. Yet when he signed to NXT, that was a last minute contract that they threw at him that day. And he decided to sign it. So, um, you know, I think he played the company towards the end. And... I was kind of sad to see him go because uh, I thought he was coming into his own as a heel. As a babyface, I think he was a, a nightmare. But he was he was doing well. He kind of he kind of made the championship, championship seem like it mattered. We never really got that Aaron Rex and Galloway feud that they looked like they were going to try to put together. Um, kind of came into the year as a champion, loses the title to Moose. Moose falls in love with this championship like it's the greatest thing that's ever happened in professional wrestling. And I think he was a pretty decent champion. I think he held it a little long. And uh, now EC3 is a champion. EC3, as a shoot, doesn't care for the title. I don't believe want it. And uh, the division has been kind of a mess. I'm one of the people, I like the concept. It doesn't bother me in any way whatsoever. I think it's something different. I always appreciate different. So Adam, we'll go to you first on the Grand Championship. We only had three champions this year. Every other division had, well, the, cha the global championship had three, but um, the other divisions we spoke about so far had four different champions. Drew, Moose, yeah, EC3. I, I thought, yeah, it was good. I mean, Drew, Drew Galloway, uh, to be honest, I, I know he's Scottish, so I should like him, but I just never liked his promos, didn't particularly like his wrestling, so it was no loss for me when he left. Uh, but with regards to the championship, I quite like I, I like the concept, to be honest. And I think it was definitely a, a Billy idea of trying to get it more real, more like an MMA match or a boxing match or something like that. So on that theory, it could very well work on someone like KM going forward, you know, who wants to join uh, America's top team, who's, who's a, a fan of MMA himself. You know, I'd like to see someone like him get a run with the belt because I think he desperately needs to do something. But with regards to the year it's had, it hasn't helped that we've had EC3 who obviously just doesn't like it and hates it. So that hasn't helped. But Moose, I thought, was a good champion, a uh, really good champion, actually. And I think that he elevated that title. He made it seem important. He was traveling around the world defending it. So, yeah, I think it's been an all right year for it. It's just they've got to decide do they want to keep it or not because at the moment, They've got it, but they don't know what to do with it. Yeah, I'm in agreement with Adam on that. Um, you know, at first I was all for it, but I want to say, you know, the previous match that we got with uh, EC3 versus uh, Matt Seidel, that really kind of had me change my mind a little bit. I think the most important thing with the grand title, the beginning of the year, it seemed like a legitimate mid-card title. And, you know, I'll keep saying this again, the one one of the many problems that has plagued this company is a non-committal to a mid-card championship. If that's going to be your mid-card belt, you need to have some mid-carders challenging for it and you need to commit to it, make it seem important. And, you know, if they felt it was a Billy idea, then they should have scrapped it. But I thought, you know, I was under the mindset that, you know, having, you know, Moose win it and, you know, when they had Galloway and having all, you know, some of these guys win it, you know, they were going to go along with it just with some minor tweaks. So, you know, overall, um, it, it was kind of a hit and miss. I think it just depended who was champion at the time. I thought, you know, when you had Moose, when you had Galloway, I thought they were great champions. And then, you know, when they put it on EC3, that's when we kind of seen it kind of just, you know, go downhill. And, you know, once again, I always say I don't hold him at fault, although, you know, him taking that as a demotion is kind of like, hey, you're a top guy. You could really help elevate this championship. You know, because whoever beats him for it, you know, that's a nice rub. But creative really had, has done him a disservice, you know, putting him in matches where he's not defending the belt. And I think 
that's one of the biggest things with any championship. When you have a champion competing in matches or on big, you know, whether it's pay-per-views, specials or whatnot, and they're not defending their title. Instead, they're in some kind of six-man tag. I think that hurts the championship in, in a little bit. So that's just something that they need to, you know, decide moving forward. If they're going to scrap it, go ahead. But if you're going to commit to it, you know, build up some mid carters, you know, have some kind of tournament, you know, number one contendership, whatever the case may be. But if you're going to keep the, the belt around, you need to show some commitment to it. And and for what it's worth, I thought in this past year, the grand championship matches when we actually had them, <clears throat> I thought we're pretty good. I thought the match with EC3 and Fall Bot was decent. I thought EC3's match with Matt Seidel was pretty good. I thought his matches with Moose were, were good. I thought Moose put on some good matches. So I think for what it's worth, we've seen good matches. The only bad ones we kind of saw were towards the end with you know Aaron Rex maybe. But um, I think had that championship started off with Eddie Edwards instead of Aaron Rex, I think we'd right you know now I think we'd be talking about it totally different. So here's the uh, the the tough question. And I'll ask you, Ro, first, what do you think is the future of the Grand Championship next year? I don't want to say who's going to have the biggest year because we don't even know what, what the hell's going on with that belt and who's who's going to be competing for it. We have no idea. But who do you what, what do you think 2018 holds? But before actually I get into that, I actually want to ask you, what do you think about this three-way match coming up? I already know Adam's opinion from the uh, other podcast, but uh, I was always a, um, supportive of them doing a triple threat match for that title. Um, it, I like the fact that it shows that they're trying new things with the concept because, you know, I always had thought with the concept that they had in place, it kind of limited them as far as what they can do because, you know, sometimes, you know, there's nothing wrong with a multi-man match as long as you don't, you know, beat it to death. So I always was wondering, like, you know, putting, having a triple threat match, especially when you have, you know, big, you know, a big pay-per-view, that way you get more people on the card, but I like the idea so, you know, I'm all for it. But as far as moving forward for next year, see, I'm in between because I look at it like this. When you have the new regime coming in with uh, Cyrus and then, you know, we already have Diamor, it, it's one of two things could happen. They can decide, hey, we're going to make this be our mid-card championship. You know, we're going to tweak a little bit, you know, a little bit of the rules and go move along with it. Or they're just going to entirely scrap it bring back the TV championship and run a tournament. And I mean, if they decide to go the latter route, I mean, I don't blame them because it comes to a point sometimes when you got a new regime coming in, you know, you're not going to always inherit, you know, the old, you know, old concepts if it's not something you're fully behind. So, it, I mean, it can go either way. But I mean, if they do decide to scrap it, as long as, you know, if they bring back the TV championship or, you know, maybe do some kind of unification where that way the history of the grand championship, you could still keep it in some ways. But, you know, as long as they commit to the mid card title, I think they'll be fine. So I don't know if that really answers your question. So I, I'm kind of like 50 50 that they keep it, and, you know, they scrap it. I think they should uh, sell it to Billy Corgan uh, and make 50 bucks. Uh, <laughs> in all seriousness, I, I really don't mind the time. I, I, I quite like it, something different. Uh, but as, as Ro just said there, you know, they just have to either get behind it or turn it into a secondary title of some sort. Uh, what I'd like to see for it is someone who is going to enjoy defending it. And, and I actually think KM's that man. I, I really do. I think KM is absolutely suited to it because he's a big guy. And, and it's the belt that you want to put on someone like with Moose before you move him into a a bigger storyline and i think moose will be one of the next top guys to to go for the you know the top belt uh because he's been sidetracking the at&t stuff but th they've used him in the right way uh, moose the, he elevated the title then he's gone to another storyline he'll eventually go main event and i think whoever goes for the grand championship next should be a similar kind of character which is why i do think someone like sadal of uh falabar falabar uh needs it <laughs> because I don't really see them going above that title. Uh, whereas I think someone like KM, you can see him eventually moving up to being a top heel in the company or something like that. So put it on KM, give him uh, give him three, four months up to the pay-per-view with it. See what he can do. I hope they figure it out with this championship. Uh, they decide to move on from it. 
I think what they need to do is actually hold a fan vote online, much like when they decided to go back to the six-sided ring. That way you just put it in the fans' hands, and uh, if they choose not to no longer have the title, you move on to something different, and that way <laughs> you don't have to overthink it creatively. So uh, I don't know. I hope they kind of figure this out, and um, I think if they found a way to make the, the matches a little more enjoyable because we just keep getting this person wins one round, this person wins a second round, and then it goes to a draw. The only time I remember um, someone actually winning the match was uh, Mar Marche Rocket when he lost the Moose in the second round very quickly. You know, it wasn't a competitive match. When Moose won the title from Aaron Rex, he won it in the first round. Aaron Rex won a couple where he actually pinned the opponent. If you remember with Aaron Rex, he never used to win the rounds, but he used to win the match by pinfall. So I think there's some more creative ways they could end these matches. And I think for the most part, they try to do stuff different every once in a while, but they just got to, they got to find something to make it. You know, when, uh, when Galloway had, uh, I don't remember if he won or lost, but he gave Moose a low blow and he lost the point. Like I want to see more of that kind of stuff. Um, just one other idea to throw in there, which they could bring back, which would help with it. They could do it. Like, uh, remember when they used to have open fight night uh, every once in a while, randomly, you know, where the, the challenges, people just would come up and rock up and challenge for one of the belts. I think they should make it an open challenge each week, and you never know who's going to come down and face the champion for the belt. I'd like to see that kind of concept come back, because it keeps it interesting. Because at the moment, you know, this feud with Falabar and and Matt Sedell, you know, it's not really going to go anywhere until eventually it's going to be a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, at the pay-per-view and someone's going to take the title. Whereas if every week you don't know who's coming down, it, to me, it makes it interesting. You don't know who's going to debut next. I, I, I think, I, sorry, I was just going to say that, you know, to me, that's an interesting concept. You know, I'd like to see, you know, Jack Swagger walk down, you know, one week. And of course, then he'll win it and go on and unify all the belts and leave. But um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd, I'd like to see someone, you know, so you just, even if it's a, a I was going to say a transient wrestler coming through, you know, someone you haven't seen on telly before, just to break in new talent who can come back at a later date, even, you know, showcase some wrestlers from the, the other partnerships. Yeah, you know, the one thing, one change I would like them to do, and I think if you're going to utilize the judges, instead of stopping after, you know, I think what is it's three minutes each match, uh, each round, correct? Yeah. Instead of stopping after the end of three, let them wrestle for the full nine minutes, okay? And then and then at the end, you know, you can ground, um, grade, you know, the rounds if you want to do it like that. Or instead, after the three, three, uh, three minutes are up, you stop, break, and then start into the next round. Like, pretty much, instead of stopping for the judges, um, how they're grading the rounds, let them grade the rounds towards the end. That way it's not messing with the flow. I agree. I totally agree. Just like they do in boxing or MMA, where it's just, we don't really know how they're judging it. But at the end, if, they're just, is, if there's a decision, then read it off. But I, th I think that would be actually pretty helpful. So we'll see what happens with the Grand Championship. They've got the old Impact logo on there. So um, I agree. Maybe sell, maybe sell it to Billy Corgan. I think he would run with it. Uh, with the NWA concept, and maybe it would work on the indies a little bit better. Let's transition into the global championship. This was another strange year because we started off the year with Bobby Lashley and, uh, you know, being the monster champion. And then we get the GFW championship kind of brought into the fold when Magnus showed up with it, ends up losing. And um, and to that point, I, didn't, I forgot to mention Christina on Erie bringing the GFW title early in the year and then uh, losing it to Siena. And uh, when I – we'll get into my Adam Thornstow interview because it's coming up very soon, but he, he kind of dropped some interesting stuff on Christina Von Erie uh, as far as when she – how long she was actually with the company. So, um, But getting away from that, Magnus ends up dropping his title to El Patron, and Lashley had said, you know, that's the title that you guys – can, can fight for because it's obtainable. This one's not obtainable. Um, and then they unify the titles, I believe, at Slammiversary. And the global championship is the current championship with an impact, almost looks like a sticker over it. From what I'm understanding, there will be a new title in 2018. 
uh, for the for the global champion. But uh, El Patron wins it, has the drama, gets stripped, vacated. Eli Drake wins a title, is thrust into the main event picture. And as Adam kind of says, he's kind of been a sideshow. Has an he's, he's got a couple good victories, but he's been he's been the v- victim of really TNA booking with as far as winning the title by hitting somebody with it, um, with the ref bumps, uh, yeah, Bound for Glory, the, one of the worst finishes in the history of wrestling. Uh, so we want to see Eli Drake have a, have a much bigger year. He had a big year, but we need him to have a monster year. So what do you got on the global championship scene, uh, Adam? Uh, basically, I I just hate the way it's been booked all year. Um, I really do. Uh, I, 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 you know, Eli Drake has is, is been for years my f- favorite wrestler in TNA now Impact. And it's just been such a lackluster year for him. I mean, don't get me wrong. I loved it when he won it. It was a, a genuine surprise for me. You know, he won it uh, in that battle royal. But it's, it's just been, I don't know, just not very interesting. And his title reign, every week he's jobbing or he, start, you know, he attacks on from behind, but then they get the better of him. It's, you, set up, you brought up Magnus about being the GFW champion. And it actually reminded me of Magnus's TNA championship run at the moment, where he's being booked as such a weak champion. And I really hope that at some point he gets some good legitimate wins. And he was getting them when he was touring around, you know, the other promotions, but he hasn't got them actually on impact. And, and that's what he needs at the moment. Because he, he does look like a paper champion. Or, and Alberto is still being booked to the moon, you know, as, as, as such a strong character. And I just hope eventually he has a clean win against Alberto without any shenanigans going on from outside from Johnny Impact or something like that, because he needs it. He actually needs a, a really good win on his CV, because at the moment, it, it's been a lackluster uh, reign. And not because of Eli, I might add. He's been great on the mic. He's, he's, he's walked around like a champion, but they just haven't portrayed him as a champion on the show. It just seems like they don't, they're only able to get behind the champion if it's somebody from, you know, the outside. It seems like utilizing who they have anytime they decide to put the championship on one of the homegrown guys, they always have some kind of trouble where they can't make them look strong. I mean, the only time we've seen Eli look dominant is when he's, you know, essentially been facing X Division guys. And I mean, while, you know, the matches have seemed competitive, which, you know, I enjoy, but anytime we've seen him interact, interactions with uh, El Patron, you know, El Patron's, you know, always look like the stronger guy when Eli Drake's the champion. And I do think, um, at least in my eyes, the association with Adonis, I think it's kind of run its course now, now that Eli is, you know, essentially at, you know, the top of the mountain because he's champion. But yeah, moving forward, man, um, I just like to see them, you know, whoever they decide to put the championship on, you know, commit to that guy. And, you know, I wonder, you know, with the changes, if maybe, you know, this wasn't somebody's guy. So it's like, yeah, we're just pushing him just because, you know, it seems like a lot of the fans are behind him. But I think that's going to be the biggest thing with anybody on the roster who they decide to move forward with. Creative has to be behind that particular wrestler or it's not going to work. And, you know, I'm hoping, you know, just like what Adam said, this match leading up to with uh, El Patron for the Impact Global Championship, this can make or break Eli. If Eli goes out there, has a strong performance, and he's and you know gets a clean pin on El Patron, it, you can really make Eli you know that guy. But if you know you have a lot of uh, shenanigans and you know interference, ref bump, bumps, etc., uh, you know you're talking about you know like El Patron's was stating a paper champion. Yeah, and you remember El Patron won the title off Lashley, and it is his very first match. I was there for that, and. I've said it a lot of times that it really sucks that they had to redo his entrance. Uh, it's funny. I was looking at my phone yesterday trying to delete some old pictures. And uh, I came across the picture of Alberto El Patron because I was sitting right there when he made his debut. And I took a picture and I saw the screen behind him that said Alberto De, Patr- De Patron, D-E, because that's how they spelled it. Um, and they had to reshoot it. But that place came unglued when he showed up. It, it sucks that that didn't come across on TV. Uh, but when he won that title off Lashley, I I remember like, oh my God, they did it again. 
they had someone from the WWE come in and win a championship. Um, and, and Adam is right. El Patron has been pushed to the moon since he showed up. He's been wrestling with his shirt on lately. I don't know if it's because he's just trying to promote that shirt or um, he's trying to cover something up, but uh, or he thinks he's Sting. I don't know. But <laughs> funny enough, I did I did notice he's wearing his shirt as well. Uh, I, but it doesn't look like he's put on weight underneath. Usually, you could tell when these guys have because they wear a baggy t-shirt or something like that. But he's still wearing quite a t- tight t-shirt, and uh, yeah, it doesn't look like he's he's, he's put on any weight. I actually like the shirt. I think I'm going to buy it here pretty soon. But um, Funny enough, I own one wrestling shirt, and it's an Alberta one. There you go. <laughs> my, 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 my daughter's got the uh, dummy year one. Okay. I, oh, there you go. I have, I have the, you, you the uh, white one? Yeah, the white one. Okay. Right. I have that one too, but I ordered it a size bigger because uh, I was trying to shrink it. But for some reason, so I wear a large size shirts, but the large shirts shrink, but the XL ones don't. So <laughs> it pisses me off. So I, I bought a few XL ones at time. Like, okay, I'm just going to shrink them down to my size. And I haven't been able to shrink them even a little bit. Um, but the large shirts end up turning into tube tops. So it's kind of frustrating, but um, <laughs> no, I, I got, that doesn't mean you don't wear them. <laughs> yeah. No, I got to say the impact shirts um, don't shrink too bad. Like the, the ones when I used to order WWE shirts, those ones would shrink very fast. I actually gave, Especially because I won't wear them anymore. But I gave them all to my daughter because uh, she still likes WWE. She's a teenager and and she's uh, kind of tall for her age. So um, I kind of gave her because they kind of shrank down to a medium. And you know, she'll wear them to bed or whatever. But um, anyway, Global Championship, um, they got to get this division hot. They really do. They have to start elevating some people because right now it's a three-person division. Um, all the big names like Lashley and EC3 and Storm, who's not around anymore, they're not involved with this title picture at all so uh i don't know where they're, i don't know where they're going with it i don't think they know where they're going with it uh, i think they're going to push this down our throat until johnny impact is the champion you know i don't think there's there's a scenario where johnny impact just keeps losing and they say okay we're moving on to the next guy i think this is going to be like they're going to fight forever until uh johnny somehow wins this championship uh but I don't know. This this one's this one's confusing. They, this is the weakest main event picture they've had that I can remember. So I feel like you got to bring in guys like Swagger and stuff, guys who have a name, like you have to, because as I've said before, if the Grand Championship is not serious, you can't elevate those guys into the main event scene. You know, you have to. It has to start with that mid card title. And since it isn't, you can't just throw people, you know, you saw, see him trying to put PD Williams in there and Garza Jr. And it's like, we're not taking them seriously. We know they're not going to win the championship. I mean, but you know what, though? I think, though, in, in PD's case, in, <clears throat> excuse me, I mean, I can only speak for myself. I don't know the pulse of all Impact Wrestling fans. But I think it's just a matter of who they decide to get behind creative if you want to push PD as that dark horse underdog, I think people would buy into it. But the problem is, and we've seen it even with Garza, you know, you throw him in there and it's cool. But then it's like, OK, then he's back in the X division. It's just the not, not committing to whomever that they put in that division. So I, I, I just think moving forward, that's going to be their biggest thing. If they decide, hey, we're going to elevate this person, that's fine. Because I think, too. And with Impact as a whole, you know, the X Division and the Knockouts Division are their strong points, obviously. So I do think, and I'm, I, and I'm not saying every X Division guy, but you're going to have some of these X Division guys who are going to probably be future Impact Global Champions. So with that said, you know, you just got to just make them, you know, make us as fans buy them as contenders. And booking's everything. And I, I really think that match... You know, during Eli Drake's reign as champion, my favorite match was him defending against P.D. Williams because as small as P.D. Williams is, I, even though, I mean, in my mind, I'm I'm knowing that Eli's going to retain, I actually bought him as a contender. And, you know, having, you know, Eli Drake kick out of the Destroyer and, you know, they built the whole match about, you know, the Destroyer being a selling point, it was cool. And it, I walked away from that match just thinking, hey, if they're going to, elevate pd williams to the main event scene hey i'm all for it give us something new give us something fresh 
You know, instead of, you know, like you're saying, they're just going to keep having him face uh, Impact or El Patron until one of them beats beats uh, Eli Drake for it. You know, it comes to a point in time, if Eli Drake's beating these guys back and forth, why do we need to keep seeing the same match? You know, if you're that hell-bent on putting the belt on him, just take the belt off of Eli already. So it, I, 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 I feel what you're saying as far as with the star power, but the key thing is going to be the, the commitment of creative because then once again, what you're telling the roster that they already have is we don't believe in you guys, so we're going to go outside and bring in one of these guys, and then you put the belt on one of them, and then all of a sudden, like, you know, oh, we can book them well, you know? So that's just my I, thing. I, uh, you're going to hate me saying this, but I honestly think that they need to put the belt on Alberto uh, sooner rather than later, and maybe have uh, Johnny Impact and Eli Drake go off for a little side feud and have a dominant heel champion, someone who's strong, who's going to get eyes on him. I just don't think that with the dynamic they've got of the three of them at the moment, that Eli's the right guy in there. And it's a shame. It hurts me to say it because I really like Eli Drake. But I just think this hasn't been the right time for him. He hasn't had a strong enough supporting characters around him to be able to do this. And possibly just move Johnny and Eli to the side and just bring in Moose to feud with Alberto. I think that's the way that they should potentially go. So with all this being said, I want to touch real quick on the two pay-per-views this year. Slammiversary was the first one, which is was really excellent um, outside of the I, I didn't care for the X Division match at all. The two out of three falls match. But other than that, you know, I, I think there was a good build. I think they lost a lot of money at Slammiversary. So, you know, when Jeff Jarrett was like, oh, Anthem's out of money. I think Anthem was just like, no, we're not spending money on what you say anymore. I think he really put tried to put a lot of bells and whistles on stuff. And even though his, the marketing was was okay. I think Jeff Jarrett cost the company a lot of money, um, especially during Slammiversary. And then Bound for Glory comes around, no bells or whistles, horrible build, horrible build. Um, not a very good pay-per-view. And um, we need, we're need. we hoping to get three pay-per-views next year. I really hope Lockdown is one of them. You know, I, I love Lockdown. Some people seem to clown it. It's funny because they've always had some pretty innovative concepts like the, you know, the race for the case and the um, Joker's Wild, Queen of the Knockouts, uh, Six Sides, of, not Six Sides of Steel, but the Lockdown, Lethal Lockdown. I think they all have the, these great ideas. It's just they're not marketed as a big deal. You know, they could, um, I, I think, uh, I don't know if it's official or not. I think there's a rumor they're doing a Women's Royal Rumble this year, like, I would actually probably watch that. And I haven't watched that product in so long. I probably would watch that. But Impact has done, you know, a similar concept with the knockouts. Uh, they've been doing ladder matches forever with them. But it's because they don't they don't market them as a big deal. They market it as a joke. You know, the Super X Cup, you know, that could almost be like their Cruiserweight Classic to a state. I mean, obviously that was a bigger deal, but that could be a really big deal for them. And it was kind of fun to watch. And then it meant nothing and then you got the uh women women of honor uh, again i don't really care for their belt but they're, they're doing a full-on tournament for their title it's it's not like the way the knockouts did theirs and they're they're making that championship already feel like a big deal and they it's just they don't know how to market some of these really great ideas into something that's like must see so uh i know that i know i just crammed a lot into that but um I don't I don't know what next year holds for pay-per-views. It seems like we've had two years in a row at least that uh maybe even three years that Slam Anniversary was better than Bound for Glory. And I thought the last couple of Bound for Glories with the exception of 2017 were really good. You know, this one didn't really care for it. Uh what do you got uh Ro, first of all, closing thoughts on just the pay per views in general and um, you know, what what you hope to see next year. As far as Slammiversary, I really thought, you know, walking away from that pay-per-view, like, man, you know, things, you know, are about to get back on track because I think during that time, that's when, you know, the company was transitioning to GFW and going to adopt the GFW name. And, you know, outside of the main event, and just for the record, I don't hate El Patron. I just kind of felt just with anybody coming from the outside, you know, they need to be seasoned a little bit as an impact guy before you decide to put you know the you know championship belt or make them you know be a big deal just for a simple fact it shows you know your 
paying your dues, I guess, so to speak, within Impact. But I, I thought Slammiversary was was nicely, you know, put together. And then we fast forward to Bound for Glory, where you know it's always been considered the biggest show. Where I, I think Slammiversary, in my eyes, is more of the flagship show for the company. But Bound for Glory just seemed like it was just thrown together. And you know there was a lot of backstage turmoil. We saw the departure of Jeff Jarrett and and whatnot. So I think moving forward, I think we're in a good place. At least I hope. I feel like you know we could say this every year, but yeah, I, I thought Slam Reversity was nicely done, but Bound for Glory not so much. Yeah, Slam Reversity was uh, for me. I really enjoyed it, but it was my first ever pay per view um, that I've been to, and. I know it's not the same as going to a WrestleMania or something like that. For me, it was a really exciting show. And uh, it was the first time I'd been to a, to a wrestling match, funny enough, in, in about two years as well. So it had that other kind of impact for me. Um, the pay-per-views themselves, I, I enjoyed the tapings after Slammiversary more, which was probably tells you what you need to know about Slammiversary. The one thing that I, I think everyone in the arena marked out for that night was the, uh, the Joseph Park big pop pump match uh, with Borash and uh, that was great you know that was just a really fun thing to happen and I think that, that they need to have more spectacles when they have uh, these pay-per-views and that's one thing that Bound for Glory severely lacked there was nothing special about that and everyone we were talking about it beforehand weren't we saying well, we really should hope that there's going to be some final deletion type match there and it just never happened so you know, I think that that's the model that they should go forward with. You know, when they're doing these pay-per-views, always have one kind of novelty match on there. Always have one gimmick match, whether it's, as you say, Lethal Lockdown, Elevation X, we haven't seen that this year. You know, I'd like to see one of those matches. Um, so, yeah, the pay-per-views this year were, were okay. Not great. Not not going to be buying the DVDs of those ones. But uh, they, they certainly weren't the worst ones. That, that, that Bound for Glory from Japan that year, that was terrible. <laughs> Uh, I think that, that was potentially <laughs> the worst one ever. Um, but yeah, if they're going to bring one back next year, lockdown. I like lockdown, but then again, the reason I remember lockdown so much is because um, they usually the road to lockdown or whatever it was called uh, was was filmed in the UK, which I used to go and see the, the UK show. So, so I don't know if that's something that they plan to bring back. But if they're doing tapings in January, I doubt they will announce a, a March tour in the UK. So yeah, bring back three pay per views, but I don't know which one. Don't know which is the next one. All right, so last thing I'm going to ask regarding the global championship picture, who do you think has, if you could take a guess, and you might not be able to, I don't know that I can, um, who do you think has the most memorable title run? Who do you think will be champion in 2018 and, and make and, and be memorable? Um, I'll ask uh, Adam first. 2018, I think that there will be an Alberta run in there. And... I think, to be honest, I believe he deserves it. I mean, I don't like him. It's probably all the rumors you hear off, off screen about him. But I actually think that he's been very positive about the company. He's delivered in the ring. He's delivered with his promos. And, you know, I just think that he's actually been a company man through and through. So I, I think he deserves it. And his heel turn has been a breath of fresh air. So I, I think he'll play a big part. But I, I believe that by the end of the year, your champion will most probably be Moose. And I think they'll most probably have him as a babyface champion the later part of the year. And I think that he'll have a very big year next year. Um, and this might be fandom talking. I think Eli Drake, but a face Eli Drake. Because I think it's coming, you know, somewhere t sometime next year. Um, and I think just by the fans, you know, the fans are going to end up turning him face. But I think his second title run, assuming he gets another title run, I think he's going to have... Uh, you know, the biggest impact as far as uh, being impact global championship. He's going to have a good year. Yeah, I, I have to agree. I think Eli Drake is going to turn face. I don't think they should. I think it's could potentially ruin him because, you know, look what happened with EC3. He turned face. They did a great double turn with him and Matt Hardy, and it just never, never really took off like the heel did. Um, and then they now he's a heel again, and they have not been able to capture that magic at all. Uh, because I think they need to go back to some of the elements that made EC3 great when he was a was that top heel. Uh, EC, uh, Eli Drake can be that top heel. I think uh, I forgot who said it earlier. I think they do need to move on from Adonis. I really think he needs to have a 
female in the corner with them. Um, I don't know if they're going to go back to that. Not a lot of uh, valets exist anymore, but I think that would um, do magic to him. Much like Sammy Callahan added something to OVE, I really think adding a strong female would be great for him. Um, especially if he kind of kicks Adonis to the curb in the process. Uh, I remember a long time ago, Ted DiBiase's son kicking uh, Virgil to the corner in favor of Maurice. And I thought that was great. So I could see something like that, um, which would be really awesome. Uh, I think Moose is going to have a title run next year. I think he very could possibly close the year as a champion. Um, but I'm going to say El Patron has the longest and strongest run. I think Eli Drake should be the guy to break Bobby Roode's record. I don't think they're going to do it, though. So. Um, so that will do it for our year in review of 2017 it was a very, uh, strange year, but hopefully next year we see some, uh, consistency in the booking and the creative and who we see on TV from uh, week to week. That may not be the case because they're going to, I know they're going to bring in a lot of new names and they may not necessarily be in long-term contracts, but I think that could be genius at the same, uh, same token. Like if they, if you know, um, hey, Wrestler X is going to be there for this set of tapings, maybe, um, and you kind of do some of the booking around that guy as being a special guest. You know, maybe it, um, they're able to put a, a better marketing and promotion plan into each set of tapings, kind of like Cody Rose. Like, hey, we know Cody's going to be here. He didn't move the needle even one viewer, but, you know, that general concept. You know, hey, this guy's going to be here for this set of tapings. Um, not going to be long term. If they make it clear he's not there long term, you know, maybe it'll work. So thanks for listening, and uh, we will talk to you guys next year. Peace.